I'll try that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for coming down. Hi, <laughs> so, give us some history uh, about yourself, where you've come from, your background in music. Okay, um, well, um, it's probably quite important to talk about how I got into music in the first place. Because music wasn't in my home, music wasn't in my background. So it was uh, actually a box of Lego that was donated to me that had a recorder in it that started everything off when I was little. And uh, very quickly, um, amazing music teachers picked up on something that I could do. And I ended up playing the clarinet and the bassoon and getting free lessons through Birmingham Music Service and free instruments, which um, without that I couldn't have got into music. So it's been an amazingly, I'm quite evangelical about music education, about people getting opportunities to play music because of the fact for me, I've probably met more interesting people, I've travelled the world, I've done all sorts of things just because I've got into music really. And so um, I went on to do a music degree um, at university, uh, felt there was a bit of an issue that they had a sports council at the student union but not an arts council so I set it up um, and that's still going today, the arts council in Sheffield University. Um, from that I ran a uh, student arts festival didn't like the university choirs because <laughs> there was either a really, really posh one that only really, really talented people could get into or a really, really huge one that everyone was in. It was a bit rubbish. Um, I wanted one in the middle that could just have really good singers in it but enthusiastic people as well, people who weren't music students. Uh, so I set my own choir up that carried on for a bit after I left as well. Um, and then when I graduated, I realised I didn't want to be a music teacher after all. I wanted to do something more interesting. and. Uh, I think it was my bassoon teacher who realised I hadn't practised again and said, but you've been doing all these festivals, why don't you go into running events and festivals, you obviously like it. And I was like, oh, can I get a job doing that? <laughs> so um, I started um, my career um, in the education department of the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, uh, three days a week, a uh, sort of traineeship job when I graduated. And what was brilliant about only getting a job for three days a week is that I sort of sold myself to whoever would pay me to run music projects in the city while I was doing that. So I worked for the MAC and I worked for all sorts of weird and wonderful music festivals and music organisations. Um, mostly doing things, two things, I either was involved with marketing and promoting gigs or I was involved with, um, and gigs could be classical gigs and all sorts of different sorts of gigs. Um, uh, and the other thing I did was getting involved with kind of music education, kind of taking orchestras into schools, getting musicians to work in communities. I worked for a company called Sound It Out back then, firstly as a volunteer, then they gave me a bit of a job as well. And um, so suddenly I knew, I knew there were things I could do with my time, <laughs> having graduated with just a music degree uh, and no sense of what sort of career was out there. Um, and have just evolved a career really over 15, 17 years, whatever it is, um, of, of um, music festival management um, and promotion and I split it between that and a kind of, as I say, evangelical zeal for taking music and art into places where it wouldn't already happen so that maybe there are other people like me when I was a kid who kind of trip over it and go, you know, have that moment, which we all have, the goosebump moment when music hits you and you go, this is for me. So, yeah, that's what I do. Okay, so that is a potted history. Yeah. What sort of projects have you been involved with, say, in the last six months, well, how do you fit into Birmingham and beyond? Because I, I know you're not strictly only involved in local projects anymore. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm involved with a project I've been doing for five years now called The Flyover Show. Um, which is a, a free music festival that happens under the flyover in Hockley, a place that previously was only known for um, drug taking and not being a place you really wanted to go because people go down there to go to the toilet generally and nothing else. So um, the artist I work with, Soweto Kinch, uh, spotted this as a potential amphitheatre, natural amphitheatre for music events, but also because of where it is, right in the heart of the sort of Hansworth, Hockley community that it might be a place where people might come who wouldn't otherwise go to a gig in say Centenary Square or Victoria Square in the centre of town 
Um, and so we've been doing that for five years now, um, and it's a free gig, and because of Soweto's musical, musical background, it's made half jazz, half hip-hop. It's a quite an interesting mix. So we get the kids who turn up who are into their hip-hop, and then the next thing we throw at them is this amazing jazz pianist, and they're just not ready for it, but actually generally really, really enjoy it. And also we get the sort of jazzers who come down for the hardcore jazz bits and then end up listening to a rapper. And so <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite good. And again, in my kind of line of work, I care about people tripping over things they wouldn't normally trip over, so that's perfect for me. Um, and we were recently uh, given the opportunity to do that gig in South Africa. So I've just come back from doing that. Um, and I currently am running a music festival at the Roundhouse in London, which is a choir festival. So I'm getting the chance to combine my passion for choirs, which I've always had, um, with the festival management side of things as well. Fantastic. That's quite a CV, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sticking to a local theme, because that's why we're here, what do you think of the diversity of, of music in Birmingham? Where do you like to go? Good venues, bad venues, what do you like to see? Um, when I get to go out, it's very diverse, as you'd expect, and Birmingham's a great place for that. Um, maybe it's because I'm a Birmingham girl, I don't know, but obviously for me, I like to go and see gigs um, that can, can, can be anything from a, an orchestral gig or an opera gig, right through to um, getting to see something at the Hare and Hounds, or um, I don't very often go into town to the obvious places like the O2 Academy and things like that, unless there's a particularly big band that I've you know, got some sort of girly relationship with on the whole. Now, personally, I think there's a lot of very good local music some not so good local music, but there is some good local music that, that should possibly see, receive more national sort of attention or certainly be out in the area. Um, why do you think Birmingham's generally overlooked? Because I think it is. You know, it's an endless question, isn't it? And um, there are lots of sort of theories that people bandy about, about, you know, we're so close to London that the A&Rs don't come out this way, they go to Manchester because they get an overnight stay, whereas they come to Birmingham they're expected to travel back. So being the sort of people that they are, they prefer the overnight stay and the night out in Manchester. I don't know if that's true. I also think we don't tell the Birmingham story very well because it's really hard to tell. And, you know, in my time I've tried to tell it. Um, but, you know, the diversity of Birmingham, the fact that we're good at so many different things, you know, we've got history and sort of reggae and all these different art, musical forms that we're known for. We're almost not known for anything. <laughs> You know, yeah, whereas places yeah. like Manchester, you think of house music or you think of a particular band or a particular era that makes it you famous. You think of the baggy scene when you've you got Manchester. It becomes very obvious. I went out for a drink with a friend the other day, you know, and he was bemoaning the fact that all his favourite bands just go to Wolverhampton. So, you know, when they're on tour. Yeah. And so there's a kind of thing around Birmingham where I don't know if we, um, we just don't project the right image or whether actually we um, don't have the right venues. All those things people talk about, but we have, I think, loads of really good venues. Whether we're promoting them properly might be the thing. Mm. It is quite tough to get audiences out and to come to see your shows here. Um, and maybe there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but, you know, having good scene that musicians can cut their teeth on and gigs where they'll get people to come is part of developing musicians isn't it and getting them to go on to the next thing so is all of this tied into why bands don't leave Birmingham I don't know I don't think I've got the answers but it's just those are the sort of things that go into my head when we start to talk about why does Birmingham get overlooked mm -hmm. maybe you know we have some issues there that we need to tackle and some of it's practical you know there's no, the transport system's problematic. We're a really big city. Yes. We're bigger than all the other cities. Mm -hmm. You know, London's a pocket of different smaller towns, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, uh, but Birmingham's a big city. And to get back from the city centre late at night, other than taxi. With the advent of Facebook, um, MySpace, which is, is kind of dying off, but with all of that internet ability that, that bands can tap into, do you think that's generally helped bands or hindered them? Does it help you as a promoter in what you do, um, or does it hinder? It helps me enormously. I think I use it a lot, and I get a lot out of using uh, Twitter and Facebook and all of that. But like all bits of marketing and promotion, it's one little world you're tapping into. And if you think that that is the world, 
and you put everything on that and you don't do anything else, then you're missing a point. It's like, you know, going to, in the past, with your flyers to the local music venue and sticking your flyer down next to millions of flyers. Why is anyone going to pick your flyer up just because you put it there? Yeah, you know? Why is anyone going to read your poster on the wall amongst all the other posters? Mm -hmm. And if you think about the kind of research that's been done around marketing that says your new audience, you get 4% of your new audience from posters and flyers. So when people think, oh, I've put loads of posters and flyers out, I'm going to get loads of people come to my gig, you might get the people who've been before from that. Because, you know, that people who've seen you before recognise your flyer and go, oh, yeah, that was great, I'll go back for that. But if you think you're going to get new people, then that's, you know, that's an old piece of research. But if you think, if you apply that to the internet and people getting an invite to your gig, let's all just think about this. When we look at our Facebook accounts, how many invites do I get every day to gigs? And unless something pings out at me or I've got a piece of recognition or something that makes me think, oh, yeah, I've heard about that or I've been to that before, it goes straight onto the delete key. Mm. So the idea that somehow the internet, you know, is, is the answer to everything is, is, is entirely wrong. It's just the same as it used to be, um, but you can get it to more people more easily and it's cheaper and that's brilliant. And as a promoter I use that all the time. Um, but you have to be very mindful that you're, you know, you're on that big table of flyers with everybody else and you still have to put something together that's really, really good. Your product has to be really, really good because then when somebody goes to see your gig, they'll tell everyone about it next time. You know, it's that kind of stuff that still, I think word of mouth is really the only way. So the best thing I, the thing I like about Facebook, um, for example, is that you can, you can, you can get people talking about what you do. And they do talk about it. And people love pressing the share button when they really like something and they feel proud about something. They'll press the share button. And that's what you need to get people doing is other people pressing the share button and what you need to... Your, your relationships with those people, you need to go on and thank them, you know. Yes. And, and all of that interaction is what you couldn't do with flyers, you know. And someone picked your flyer up before you didn't know they picked it up. But now you do, so you can go, thanks for that, see you there. All that sort of stuff that makes the human connection um, easier than it was before. And on a positive note then, we'll end on something positive. <laughs> and <laughs> what do you think Birmingham offers to, to people that come uh, that people should go and see, that people should be aware of in the city in terms of music and art because... Well, you know... Um, <laughs> That's not very positive. There's... <laughs> uh, yes, it's all right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thinking that there's just so much that um, I, would, I would want people to see and where do I start. We've got some... We've got some almost unique stuff going on here and the one that springs to mind, interestingly, whether your audience wants to know or not, is Birmingham Opera Company, who, um, and people go, opera, what's that all about? But actually the way they present their operas is something you've never ever imagined before, and you don't have to dress up, and you don't have to sit for three hours listening to some fat woman singing. It's actually really, really good, and really, really interactive, and really, really edgy. And um, I don't think, I don't think in the world you've got many opportunities to see something like that, and it's happening in Birmingham. And again, who knew? Because have we told anyone? <laughs> and we've got, you know, a world-class opera, opera um, director in our city. He's often in Venice and other places too because he's, you know, he's world-class. But he's here doing something and committed to Birmingham and doing it here and doing it in an interesting way. And we've got loads of little gems like that. But that is exactly the sort of thing that we do want to talk about and progress. Because we don't want to remain insular about sort of, this is a four-piece band with two guitars and a bass player and a singer. That there is a bigger world out there and out there is right on your doorstep uh, and there is a lot that, that goes on in Birmingham that just doesn't get the recognition that it deserves. But it's all part of how musicians make their money, you know, this rich tapestry of the different kinds of music that's going on, the festivals that happen, the little gigs, the education work in schools, that's how people make their careers tick now, you know, it doesn't, it's not just a matter of being a teacher in a school a music teacher or a musician or unemployed. There's a whole range of other things you can be doing. <laughs> musician and unemployed usually go hand in hand. <laughs> well, I did a music degree and we had a careers uh, officer come in and say, because you've got a music degree, you can be a teacher, a musician or even an accountant. <laughs> and that was it. Oh, so, so, but there's, there's a very rich, you know, um, variety of things you can be doing with your time as a musician these days. And Birmingham has it all going on. What a great place to end. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming in.
I wouldn't even want to answer that question, really. That's fair enough. We'll let it out then. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know.